Amplified Unit. Red Team, go! Salud! Monday Night Raw, December 13, 2021. Oh, we're gonna talk about it. But if you guys are looking for our number one, that review of last night's Raw, you're gonna have to go on the channel and check out the very last video that I put out. It was a watch-along, a live reaction of our number one. So if you want my review of our one, check out that video and you're gonna get my live review, live response. Seems like you guys are really enjoying that, so it's something I at least, even if I only have time for one hour, man, on these three-hour shows... Something I kind of want to do. I did both hours of SmackDown this past Friday. So something I want to do in the future. Again, Wednesday nights are a little bit harder to do for AEW, but I'm glad you guys enjoyed that, man. Hundreds ended up catching it live. We're already into the thousands that ended up catching it later. So again, even if you didn't catch it live, man, people are enjoying that. So check out our number one. We had a lot of fun, man. Uh, we talked Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> Go figure, bro. Aaron Rodgers, man. WWE planted a fan, and I truly believe this was a planted fan. Going back and watching it now, um, he didn't just have the jersey on, but he had a, this bright pink uh, shirt covering it. So usually plants have some distinctive thing about them. I think they knew there could be some other Packer fans, which there were last night, even though it's Minnesota. Um, so they put this pink shirt over it as well. And there's this big sign that says Aaron Rodgers owns Seth Rollins. And of course, if you guys follow football at all. Uh, you know that Aaron Rodgers has said in the past that he owns the Chicago Bears. And we just took on each other uh, this past Sunday night. And the Packers defeated the Bears 45 to 30. So Aaron Rodgers still owns the Bears. He refuses to apologize. I love it. And uh, so this fan brought this sign that says Aaron Rodgers owned Seth Rollins. And not only did he have that sign front and center, not only did the cameraman pan to it several fucking times, Kevin Dunn left that right in the middle of frame, but it was exactly where Seth Rollins stopped for his promo with Kevin Owens, right in front of this fan. And then minutes later, Adam Pierce comes out with his Green Bay Packers tie. Minutes after that, we pan to commentary where Byron Saxton is in his Minnesota Vikings suit. <laughs> so it was very NFL heavy at the beginning, at the jump, man. And of course, you had the Rams and the Cardinals. So Vince McMahon is going to try to tap into that NFL audience. Um, but that definitely looked like a plant. But who gives a fuck? I mean, when you look at the three hours of Raw last night, that was probably the one main talking point that you're going to be discussing here the next morning, the next day. It's Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers is what we're talking about when it comes to Monday Night Raw, man. <laughs> Fucking hilarious, dude. Oh, it's Seth Rollins too, man. I, I, I captured this great... Uh, photo to I didn't take the photo but I was able to catch this photo and I believe it's probably going to be the thumbnail mo more than likely but it's of Rollins staring right at the sign <laughs> I thought it was great man and by the way the Cardinals lost last night so my Packers are now the number one team in the NFL the number one seed in the NFC right now and I believe we have the best record in the NFL maybe an AFC team has also three losses if there is a, a team with only two losses, man, more power to them. That's hard to do right about now, uh, this late into the season. But we are the number one seed in the NFC, which means home field advantage thus far, man. If we can play a playoff game in Lambeau Field, we're on the fucking way to the Super Bowl, baby. That road is looking much more brighter right now. But uh, I thought that was fucking awesome, dude. Uh, whether it was a plant or not, I believe totally because of that pink shirt going back and watching it, watching it, how it was panned out, how Kevin Dunn had it right in the middle of frame. Seth Rollins stopped right there. More football references minutes later. Um, but fuck it. Plant or not. BC loved it. A little bias there because I'm a huge Packer fan, as you guys know. But honestly, man, it's not bias 
at all when I say that when I look at the three hours of the show. I mean, that's one of the only talking points that I can really take from last night. One of the things that really popped off the screen. One of the things I can actually discuss and have a conversation about. Because the rest of the three hours, man, I'm just not quite sure I can say that. Two of those hours we're going to go over right now with one another. And the first hour, like I said, go back on the channel and I went over that whole first hour live with you guys. It wasn't just the Packer references and the Aaron Rodgers owning Seth Rollins, but it was also Dewdrop, man. And what happened to her? Piper Niven is a pretty good wrestler. Dewdrop last night brought up uh, an F performance. And in that live reaction, I told you just how disappointed I was in Dewdrop's performance uh, against Bianca last night. And we also talk about why Otis and, and Matt Riddle in that match last night, why that should not have been happening, and why the fallout of it is absolutely horrendous. I went over all of that live with you guys. So now let's go over the next two hours of Monday Night Raw. And before I do, let me end this little cold open with some more Jeff Hardy news. Now I know, I know, we're all just worn out with this Jeff Hardy news, man. We have ran it into the ground because there's just no real information. And there's a lot of fans just concerned with him and a lot of people close to Jeff just saying, don't be, he's good. His wife, Beth, said he's good. Matt Hardy, several times, says he's good. And then you have last night, I believe it was on his social, maybe it was like a Twitch but Matt Hardy to spoke a little bit more in depth. And I'm glad he did. Because before Monday Night Raw, or hours before, he was telling people to just wait until you have all the facts before you jump to conclusions. But as BC told you in that Hour 1 live reaction video, we talked a little bit about it. And I said, well, we don't have any facts. You're not being transparent at all. Like, there's one thing to just be private, that's fine. But you have to give some transparency, right? People are actually concerned. So you have to weed out some of the um, things that we're thinking, right? Set people's minds at ease a little bit and then keep everything else private, no question. But you have to have some transparency. I mean, this isn't the first, second, third, fourth, fifth time that Jeff Hardy has done something wild like this. So at this point, when people keep believing in you and you keep disappointing, no matter who's telling the truth, what the actual facts are, you kind of got to set people's minds at ease just a little bit. Just a little bit. Nobody was doing that. So people obviously were going to jump to conclusions. Matt had to have known that, and he did. He ended up going on his, I believe it was his Twitch, uh, later that night, last night. And he spoke a little bit more, and he said something very... Um, interesting to BC. This pretty much puts to bed one of the conspiracies, if you will, that the wrestling community had. And that wild story is that Jeff Hardy did this on purpose so that he could go to AEW. And Matt Hardy uh, said the words last night, he feels that WWE jumped the gun a little bit in releasing Jeff Hardy, his brother. I'm going to say that again. Matt Hardy thinks that WWE jumped the gun in releasing uh, Jeff Hardy. What that tells you right there is this was not some premeditated plan by Jeff and Matt to get Jeff over to AEW. It, it, that's just stupid to think that Jeff would go about business that way anyway. Right? If you really, if that is your plan just to get out of there and you want to work for AEW with your brother one day, you wouldn't do it that way, right? And I've said this a hundred times in the past week. You wouldn't leave your brothers in the ring. You wouldn't leave them. You wouldn't take security with you because you had to have known if you go into the crowd, you're going to have a security guy with you. So you wouldn't take that security away from your brothers who are trying to perform just so you can take your ball and go home and going to business for yourself. Jeff Hardy's not a douche like that. He's not a scumbag. He would not do that. So right there, that conspiracy just makes Jeff look like an absolute idiot and a selfish prick. And so anybody that thinks that that's okay, you're no better. But, so it's one thing to even think that that's okay or that Jeff would do that, but it's just a wild notion when you can get released a million other ways, you wouldn't have to leave a match to get released. And it was just wild, man. You had journalists, you had other podcasters, like, raising this conspiracy, raising this wild question of, 
could it be? <laughs> like, it's okay. It's not okay, man. Um, and we can't look at it as such. That is a cardinal rule in wrestling. You don't leave your brothers or your sisters in that ring uh, in combat. You know, you got to look out for one another, protect one another. That's not the way you leave a company because you want to go work for somewhere else. That, that That's a fucking, maybe a seven-year-old would do that, right? I don't even know if 10-year-old Nicholas would do that in his tag team match with Braun Strowman when they run the, when they won the Raw titles at WrestleMania. I can't even believe I'm saying that. But with this company, a 10-year-old would be winning a championship. But I don't even see Nicholas doing that, uh, making that decision. If Nicholas wanted to work for AEW, right, and he just leaves fucking Braun Strowman. Versus Cesaro and Sheamus, whoever the fucking title holders are at the time. Um, but it, Matt Hardy, thankfully, he at least threw that to the wayside. He's pretty much saying, uh, with with his own words, they jumped the gun in releasing him. That means that he doesn't feel it was right for him to get released. That's what he's saying. WWE rushed to this conclusion. Uh, before having their own facts, and he doesn't feel like he should have been released. They jumped the gun. That's what he's saying. So if he's kind of like, they shouldn't have done that, then obviously this was not premeditated. Otherwise, he would keep his mouth shut. That sucks. Poor Jeff. (laughs) Um, But now he's like, he's like, yeah, he doesn't think that was right. And and he's even talking about the drug test. He, he's like, when when the drug test comes back, uh, I I think we might be, uh, you know, we we'll have more facts. He's pri- he's pretty adamant that Jeff told him he didn't take anything beforehand, and, and that could be the case. By the way, I've said from the jump, nobody really knows. What we know is if you go back and watch that match, that was not Jeff Hardy. So whether he was on something that day, that night, or not, it still was not him. And that's why Matt Hardy also said, he admitted that earlier in the month, he didn't just say on that night after the match, earlier in the month is when Jeff Hardy turned down rehab treatment. So that was interesting as well. Matt said earlier in the month. So WWE was already having these concerns. Something was not right with Jeff. And then that night seems to be the straw that broke the camel's back. So now we're getting more to the story thanks to Matt. He's speaking up a little bit more, whether he wanted to say these little nuggets or not. VC catches all of this, man. I don't let one word go unnoticed. He said earlier in the month, he was offered rehab treatment because WWE was concerned. He turned it down and then Sunday night in Texas happened. And that's when WWE was like, dude, something's not right. So that's what BC means about if he was on something that night or not, something was wrong. For him to make such erratic, reckless, destructive decision making. Because that's what all of it was. To leave the ring like he did. And bring security with him. And just going to the crowd like it's a meet and greet. Uh, unannounced. Um, and that's exactly why... Uh, That's exactly why these words are important now, Matt speaking out and saying, okay, now the pieces to the puzzle, they're they're starting to come together. They're starting to form this puzzle, right? We're starting to get the pieces at least. Even if we can't fit them all perfectly, we're starting to at least get the pieces. So he was offered earlier in the month, uh, turned it down, and then this happened on Sunday night. and, And so what people have to realize about addiction is that you don't have to be on something on that at that time. Over time, it just fucks with you and you start making bad decisions. And I think that's what we saw with Jeff. If indeed a test comes out clean or we find out he wasn't on anything, well, that's great in that aspect. It doesn't change the fact that something was wrong that night and that dude totally tweaked. And that's why WWE's concerned. They can't have him tweaking out on any given night. That was Sunday in Texas. What's going to happen on a random Tuesday in fucking uh, Des Moines? What's going to happen on a random Friday night in Jacksonville at an event where Jeff Hardy is performing? You know, does he go up? Does he climb up on the fucking rafters and security's chasing after him and he fucking does a swanton off the rafters? (laughs) Does he go outside in the blistering cold and start climbing up the roof? I, I mean, that's what they're concerned about. 
That's why they tried to offer him help earlier in the month. There was other situations leading up to it, from what it sounds like. From Matt himself, his own brother. But at least, at least we can put aside, we can finally put to rest the conspiracy of he did this on purpose. It was a work to get out of uh, his WWE contract. We can finally say, nah, Matt Hardy's coming out and saying he feels WWE jumped the gun and Jeff Hardy does not feel that he should have been. And Jeff Hardy has spoken to him and said, no, man, wait till the test. I'm going to show you. And so Jeff Hardy's not happy about it. That shows you that he, he did not try to get out of it, at, at least this way. The guy just signed a new contract last year, man. He's going to make a ton of money for his family through 2023. I mean, even if he wanted to leave, he, there was a million ways to get released. You wouldn't do it that way to your brother. And, and, and to show you that something was wrong with the Jeff, and I don't think it was just Sunday night. Again, for WWE to offer a rehab earlier in the month, something had happened. Many things, probably. But after the match, when Jeff had already left on Sunday night, you go to the, the, the post-match through the fan video and Drew McIntyre is pointing out like, where is Jeff? And he shrugs his shoulders and he goes like that dude's crazy. And Drew McIntyre looked like he had a little problem with Jeff earlier anyway, like something was off and Drew didn't want to deal with him. That's how it looked like, man. You go back to the beginning and Drew just was never looking at Jeff on the outside. But after the match, Drew made it a point to tell the crowd that dude's crazy, man. Like, I don't know what the fuck that dude's doing. Or what he's on. And that was through Drew McIntyre. And again, before the hot tag Sunday night, before Jeff finally got out of the ring, Jay Uso had to yell something out of him. Like, basically, dude, make the tag or something. Like, get out. And again, I already said, dude, the whole match, he wasn't just selling. He was just playing dead. Something was off. And then he face planted. And I had people go, basically, I watched the match. I didn't see anything wrong with Jeff. And all I could think was, thank goodness I'm the one dissecting wrestling. Because I've been dissecting Jeff Hardy matches for a couple decades. I know exactly how a Je I know how Jeff Hardy sells. I know a Jeff Hardy match. I know when Jeff Hardy is on his game, when he's a little off, when something's not right. Um, that, was, that was something was not right from the jump. And again, whether he was on something or not on that night, it's no longer the case. Everything that he's been on over the years... It looks like it's finally catching up to him. This dude does not need AEW. This, need, this dude needs to chill, relax, spend time with his family, and just get his dome piece right, man. We're all in his corner. We all love Jeff, one of the best human beings in the world as far as personality and how caring and giving he is. It's just personal demons have not just brought himself down over the years, but his loved ones as well. And to stop that, you need to stop the same old vicious cycle. Get better, tell everyone you're better, everyone forgives, come back, do the same things over and over again. It's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. At some point, he's going to take a, need to take a long time away from pro wrestling. If that means he comes back and it's just too late, he has to retire, then he's got to. His health is more important than wrestling, bro. His health, his life is more important than another Young Bucks match, which we already saw in ROH anyway. You know, it's not needed. Of course, it's going to happen now. He's released, and after 90 days, Tony Khan could get him, and we'll get the Hardy Boys in AEW. You guys will get what you fucking crave. Another WWE talent in AEW. Which I just don't know where that ends. You guys also want Johnny Gargano in there. You want fucking Keith Lee in there. You want Kyle O'Reilly in there. We're still anticipating Bray Wyatt, Wyndham Rotunda in there. When Kevin Owens is contract up, you want Kevin Owens in AEW. You want Sami Zayn in there. You're already clamoring for Cesaro and Ricochet. I'm hearing all these names. So basically, you want the whole WWE in there. Just change the fucking name. Just keep WWE. Just change it to AEW and have Tony Khan run it. I guess. Sounds good to me. But what do you do with the 150 wrestlers already under Tony Khan's contract status? obligated to Tony Khan. You already have 150 people there. You can't get everybody. Uh, so anyway, man, I know we've been running this Jeff Hardy thing into the ground, but Matt Hardy's finally telling a little bit more details. And if you listen to his words carefully, those pieces of the puzzle are starting to come together, man. And this just seems like Jeff Hardy tweaked out. And 
you know, WWE had enough. This sounds like a series of events. And it doesn't even have to be that he was on something that night. Something happened where it culminated in this dude tweaking out. Um... And Matt Hardy doesn't feel that it was right that he got released. Jeff Hardy has told Matt that he doesn't feel it was right. He's waiting for the the, the test result just to prove that, you know, he was he was good. And that this was an overreaction from WWE. So it does not sound like they were like in a, in a plan to get Jeff out of his WWE contract so that he can go to AEW. I hope that finally puts that to rest. But with some fans, it's not good enough. They want to believe everything's a work. They want to believe it's all part of a fucking master plan. It's all a scheme. It's all a conspiracy. And you'll have those journalists and those reporters, and I use that loosely in quotes. You'll have those podcasters that want to be shock jocks, right? And they want to fucking, everything's got to be a shock to get the clicks and the views. So they're going to fucking raise this suspicion. Under the guise of, it's my job to do this. No, it's our job to raise questions, yes. Not feed into bullshit, hysteria. That should not be fucking, it should not be celebrated. It should not be looked at like it's an okay thing to do. Like, Jeff could have done this to get out of his contract, and, and can you blame him? No, you can't fucking do that. But yes, I can blame him. You want out of your contract? You really want out of WWE because your booking's bad? I hear you, bro. Good luck. Think of a creative way. You can't do that, man. That is a cardinal rule in wrestling. What Jeff Hardy did Sunday night, you can't do that. And that's what I mean. Whether he was on something or not, you cannot do that. Jeff Hardy is a million percent to blame for Jeff Hardy's decision making and actions. Jeff Hardy and Jeff Hardy alone. And Matt's telling all of us that, you know, there's going to be more to the story. Jeff's side of the story. Well, WWE has a side too, probably. And WWE probably has three or four things that Jeff Hardy do has done in the past month alone. That raised their suspicion that something's not right. Sunday night, I doubt, was the only straw in this last run. I think WWE has been dealing with this for a while now. I mean, we've seen Jeff Hardy's been a little odd lately. You saw Friday night, man. He was flossing in the middle of the ring. Jeff Hardy, he doesn't always do shit like that. I laughed. I LOL'd. I thought the dude was just ha finally having fun. That's what I said in my review. Jeff Hardy finally looks like he's having fun. Well, now we know why. The dude's been tweaking out. <laughs> but we wish the dude nothing but the best. But finally, his brother is coming out and just saying, you know, no, they, they don't feel it was right that he got released. So that tells us it was not a plan. Um, and Matt Hardy is like defending him, saying like, wait till the fucking test and stuff and wait till more details come out because, uh, you know, we don't think this is right. So, you know, does Jeff Hardy try to go back to WWE? Does he try to fulfill that contract? You know, a release is a release. I don't think Vince is just going to take him off now. I, I I think he just needs to relax from wrestling, man. Don't worry about WWE. Don't worry about AEW. Just relax. Go fishing. Go hunting. Go play with the kids. Um, go fucking scootering with Matt Riddle. But just take a lot of time off, man. Get yourself together. Much love to Jeff Hardy. And thank you to Matt, man. Whether he knew it or not, he gave a lot in that little statement. A lot that we can jump into and finally start to break this down. I it's pretty long cold open, man. But again, this is this is what everyone's talking about, man. More and more info slowly but surely leaking out. We can finally put this uh, puzzle together, man. Uh, raw. Now again, the first hour is up on the channel, man. Go check that out. That's the that's the whole live reaction of the first hour, and I wasn't too happy with uh, Dewdrop's performance. I wasn't happy with the booking of Otis and Matt Riddle, and uh, I was very happy with Aaron Rodgers, <laughs> the Packers, and Adam Pierce's tie. You'll know what I'm talking about in that first hour live reaction. Go check it out on the channel either right now and then come back, or after this video, go check it out. The second hour kicks off Bobby Lashley defeating Kevin Owens via a tap out from the Hurt Lock. Owens tapped out before Lashley even had the Hurt Locked. <laughs> so he was just putting in the fucking device, that Hurt Lock. And before he can even clamp his fingers, man, Kevin, o Kevin Owens is already tapping out. Now backstage, Rollins is flipping out like, what are you doing? You weren't even trying, bro. Now, now this is a four-way. This hurts both of us at day one. 
And Owens is like, what do you want me to do? I, I, I was going to tap out anyway. Have you ever been in the Hurt Lock? <laughs> it fucking hurts. I wasn't going to, I was getting out of that. So I just tapped out. What the fuck? I saved myself the fucking injury, he says. So I did like that interaction, man. A lot of people are flipping out over it. Oh my God, Owens, what the fuck? Looks like an idiot. And I kind of, I knew exactly what was going on, man. Owens was not going to fucking, he was, that wasn't the hill that he was going to die on. Absolutely not. He knew the, 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 there was a bigger picture at large and Owens was going to pull some shenanigans in the next two matches and make sure that Bobby wasn't in it. But he was not going to be the one to take a hurt lock to do such. So this is actually a pretty good plan by Owens. All right, I'm in the hurt log anyway. I'm tapping the fuck out. I got two more opportunities later in the night to rectify this. I thought it was brilliant, man. Everyone else is flipping out because they don't see the bigger picture. And that's why I'm number one at what I do. I'm the number one podcaster in the pro wrestling community because I, I see things from a mile away. Miles away. I'm 10 steps ahead of everybody. You know? Everybody's playing checkers while BC is over here doing some chess matches, brah. Everyone's playing Connect Four, man. I'm fucking rolling Yahtzee. So I knew exactly what was going on. I was okay with it. I'm not saying what's to come was necessarily good, but, <laughs> but this makes perfect sense. It's something Owens would do. Um, and, and as I said in, in yesterday's live reaction, I won't jump into it too much because you have to check it out yourself, but, you know, at least they had Bobby Lashley run a gauntlet. At least they didn't just add this dude in. Just snap of a finger. No justification. I mean, they, they're having this dude run through a gauntlet if he wants to be in it. Again, and I'm not saying that's the right decision, but at least make a dude earn it. Or at least have the story saying that he's earning it. So we're going to go over his next two matches. Wait till you hear what the fuck happens in these two. But up next was Becky Lynch. She's talking that shit to Liv Morgan. So Morgan has enough. Morgan hits the middle of the ramp, I'd say. Uh, middle of the aisle. And responds to Lynch. Now Morgan says this. Morgan says, Becky, you are the best. The best at cheating to win. <laughs> oh, damn. A zinger. <laughs> now, I realize everything can't be MJF CM Punk or Eddie Kingston CM Punk. You know, those epic promo battles that they were recently in. Not everyone can do that, nor should they be copying them. We saw that with Miz and Edge a couple weeks ago. It just doesn't land correctly. But you can do that style where you're hitting zingers, but not everything is going to be to that level. I understand. But this was a little corny, right? You are the best. The best at cheating to win. Like, who wrote that, man? Was that Kanice? <laughs> Did they bring back Kanice? Is she going to be writing for Bobby uh, Ashley? <laughs> Kanice Mobley is the writer that got fired a couple of months ago because she uh, she went on a podcast and admitted that she doesn't she didn't know how she got the job. And she doesn't even know the champion's name. She called him Bobby Ashley and made fun of the name Hurt Business. And then, and, and then she's got to come back and write for these people that she's making fun of. Uh, you know, that's not, yeah, obviously she was going to get fired, bro. But who's writing this? You are the best, the best at cheating to win. So, um, look, it started off as a cheesy promo just, and I love Liv Morgan. I understand it started off as a cheesy promo, but she became very emotional toward the end um, so it ended much better than it began. So I got to give Morgan that credit, man. She, she finally came back around. There's a few times where uh, a fan was like yelling at her in the front row. I think it was in respect, like a fan, a younger girl, maybe, I don't know, but she kept getting distracted and talking to the fan. You can't do that, bro. Because us at home are not really understanding what the fan is saying. So you're just having a personal conversation while you're live on TV. And then when she came back to Becky, you could tell she had to take a moment to remember what she was supposed to say. You can't do that, man, for several reasons. And that and that's uh, those are just a couple of them. So Morgan's got to get better on that. Maybe she just lost what she was saying and, that, and she used that as like a, a little regroup. But uh, 
Roman Reigns used to do that. Before, Roman was really good at talking and speaking and taking acting classes, working with people like Paul, because that's what he was doing over the last couple of years. Roman Reigns was not good at promos. He would forget what he was saying. We all remember that famous face-to-face promo with John Cena, and John Cena called him out and said, it's called a promo, kid. If you're going to be the big dog, you're going to have to learn how to do them. And everybody was like, damn! That set Roman Reigns back another year. Um, so, you know, Morgan, Morgan will get more comfortable in that spot. Morgan asked for a rematch for the title. Becky says, no, this leads to the two brawling. The fight leads to the outside where Becky gains control, pinning Liv's arm between the ring post and the steps. Becky then kicked the steps, injuring Liv's arm. Becky then says, oops, looks like you got a little injury. If you still want the rematch, you're on. And uh, so now now that she injured her, now she's going to have an easy breezy match, she thinks, at day one. But I expect Liv Morgan to bring the fight. I don't expect Liv to take the title at day one. That would be mm, pointless. This close to WrestleMania, you want the big heel to go into Mania to lose it. That's got to be Becky. So it's unfortunate because we really like Liv. It would have been cool for a lot of people if she won it last week on Raw. I understand. I just don't see why she would win it at day one. Are you going to hot potato it and then just a couple of weeks later at Royal Rumble, Becky wins it back? I don't see what that's doing for Liv Morgan or the prestige of the championship. Unfortunately, I got to say this, Becky Lynch needs to retain. But that doesn't mean that you have you drop the storytelling for Liv Morgan, man. Put her in more stories. You don't have to be in a title pitcher or a title feud or a title match or a title program to have a good story. So, uh, looks like we are going to get that rematch, and there's a, you know, there's a reason for Liv to lose at day one, man. She's going to give it the, the the old college try. She's going to bring the fight, but in the end, that that hurt arm should become the ultimate uh, issue for Morgan and the reason that she loses at day one. So, I like the way they set that up, at least. We then cut to the dog park. That's right, another dog park. Somewhere in Minnesota where Dana Brooke and Reggie are walking through the park. Snow, so obviously it just recently snowed. And Dana Brooke and Reggie are walking through the the park. And it's like a scene from The Notebook. <laughs> I'm expecting them to fucking stop and just gaze into each other's eyes and just start making out mad passionate love. But no... That's not what happens. Reggie says he's willing to teach her all of his secrets. All of a sudden, a tree and a snowman start chasing them. That's right. If you didn't see the program, good for you. Because I'm not, I haven't fucking totally lost it. Uh, I'm not pulling a fucking tweak out like Jeff Hardy here. This was a legit thing. A snowman and a tree were chasing Dana Brooke and Reggie through a dog park. Now, Obviously, the tree was our truth The snowman ended up being Ninja Tazawa. So you had a ninja snowman. I, I mean, how do you explain this to somebody who just walks in and you're watching pro wrestling? I mean, good luck. Um, all of a sudden, Tamina comes cascading in like Bastion Booger at a buffet. The way that Tamina ran through this dog park to try to get that 24-7 title... I mean, you would have thought the Green Bay Packers were going for the Super Bowl. You would have thought Batman was trying to save Gotham. You literally would have thought Bastion Booger was trying to get to the front of the line at the buffet. I mean, Tamina came cascading in like a fucking lightning bolt on a stormy night. I'm like, she does know this is just a fucking toy title, right? (laughs) Like, I mean... She play. I mean, she was told to do this job, and Tamina came fucking ready to work. <laughs> fucking hey, man. I, I don't like to see that. I saw Ember Moon break her leg chasing that title, man. Um, but she gave it her all, man. That, that that's the fastest I've ever seen Tamina work. She was going for that title, bro. <laughs> Now, Dana runs up a snowbank and dives out of frame like she's a fucking ninja, like she's she's already learning from Reggie. She goes up a snowbank and she dives off, and it was was so bad. (laughs) In her defense, she was probably sinking into the snow, but I mean, the jump was just so bad. So she jumps out of frame. Tamina is then screaming at the tree and the snowman. I can't believe these words are coming out of my mouth, but I should probably believe it. I shouldn't be shocked. It is a raw show. But Tamina is screaming at at a, a snowman in a tree. She storms off. 
in Ninja Snowman in Truth Tree start yelling at one another about who Tamina was yelling at. So it wasn't even about the title anymore. They were yelling at who Tamina just yelled at. Now, I understand if you giggled, right? Oh, basically, it was kind of funny, man. Guys, this is what I mean. When the show is this bad, and just look at the ratings. This isn't just BC, man. People are just stopping. They're, they're, they're just not watching anymore. They're stopping. I mean, you, you just this past year alone, you, you saw one eight, one nine at one point, couple points, one nine, one eight, one seven, one six, right back to one fives. I mean, you only dip now at the end of 2022 to a one point two, and by the end of 2023, at the trajectory that we're on right now, if you're gonna follow the 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 trajectory, you're gonna be at a one million if you're lucky by the end of 2023. And the reason this is happening is because nobody's captivated anymore. Nobody's caring about this. Everything just sounds silly and stupid. There's no real good storylines. And we're all just giggling. We're giggling over Matt Riddle and Randy Orton in a tag team. It's funny. RK Bro, we're giggling. Rhea Ripley and, and almost a superhero. Nikki in this costume. And, and we're giggling. Right? 24-7, the dog park. We got a guy dressed up as a tree. We got a ninja who's already, well, a dude dressed up already as a ninja. And then he dresses up as a snowman ninja. And we're giggling. And then you wonder why the ratings continue to fall and people continue to jump off the WWE bandwagon. Or just pro wrestling in itself is just at a lull, a low point. If you're wondering, look at this. You could easily, t if you're going to take the time... I'm going to give you a perfect example. If you're going to take the time to, to bring a camera crew out to a park with some of your performers, why not do something epic that people are going to remember? Utilize that in a storyline. you got to take it away from the ring every now and again. A lot more than every now and again to develop storylines. Everything can't just be settled in the ring to, to, to create storylines because it's redundancy. Right, if you're going to take the time to have a camera crew out in the park with your talent, make it be for some epic storyline. And I'll give you a prime example. Right Up next, after that dog park scene, was Finn Balor and Damian Priest being defeated. Balor and Priest in a tag team match defeated by the Dirty Dogs. Austin Theory jumped on the apron, took a selfie with uh, Balor while he was up on the top rope waiting to deliver coup de gras. And... The selfie takes place, so Balor jumps off, and, and he's distracted, and this allows Dolph Ziggler to hit the zigzag for the W. So Finn Balor, middle of the ring, one, two, three, is defeated. Him and Priest lose. And this is supposed to get us excited for Balor in theory. Now, we know the match will be good, but the storyline, that's, I mean, he's just coming out every week and doing a selfie. Can we think of something better? So this is where I go back to the, the, the dog park. Okay, you're going to have a camera crew there. You're going to have talent. You're obviously telling the, the city officials that this is happening so you can stage this production. Um, that's what always happens. WWE notifies law enforcement so they know that this is happening in case somebody's calling and seeing seven people fruit roll up one another or punching each other. <laughs> okay, so you're going through all this trouble anyway. Why for a giggly ha-ha moment that nobody gives a fuck about? Why, I would have something like Balor walking with a camera crew, and Jimmy Smith sets it up. Earlier today, Finn Balor was uh, doing a project for WWE, filming a project for w a future WWE project, right? So Balor's filming this future WWE project. He's got his camera crew there. They're walking through the park. Balor's talking about his career, some career highlights maybe. And, you know, it's in this intimate setting in this park, and they really want this to be intimate. So the camera crew's following along Balor, and all of a sudden, Austin Theory comes out of nowhere in selfies. And Balor's like, what are you doing, lad? And Austin's like, selfieing. He's like, I'm, I'm working here. I'm doing a documentary, man. This is my story, my life. And he's like, well, I just made it a lot better, didn't I? And Balor's like, are you serious? <laughs> and Austin's like, is there a problem? And they just start coming to blows. Theory does some undermined tactic, Gets the upper hand, puts Balor's dome piece on a park bench, and stomps it right on the bench. Balor is fucked up. The camera crew is trying to separate Austin Theory. Maybe even the camera gets set down, so all you're seeing is feet in the snow, and there's all this commotion. And we fade to black. And that's the segment. 
you're going to remember that part of a storyline, right? When Balor finally meets Austin Theory at the pay-per-view and you're thinking about the story that went into it, that's going to be one of the moments you're going to remember. You know I'm right, man. It's like fucking Stone Cold and Booker T in the supermarket. Well, they weren't just rolling each other up in a ha-ha segment for 10 seconds. No, Booker T's dome piece was literally going through the dairy section. <laughs> At one point, Booker T was being rung up with the fucking milk and cookies. And the fucking cereal. And the, and the, and the, and the, and the potatoes. And a fucking price check on a Booker T. I think that was a line in the segment. No, they had fun with that shit. They said, if we're going to do a supermarket segment, we're going to fucking further a storyline. We're going we're gonna to have people remember this. As ludicrous as that was, we remember that to this fucking day. You guys know I'm right, man. You could have done something cool with Balor and Theory. Instead, Theory comes out and does the regular selfie shit. And then right after, he's in Vince McMahon's office in an awkward, cringeworthy segment that he's been doing. Nobody else finds that really weird when he's in McMahon's office. It just seems like there should be a camera or somebody around with them because I just don't trust Vince McMahon with somebody like Austin Theory. With the stories that I've heard from the past, Austin Theory should have somebody in there with him or be recording at all times. It's cringeworthy, man. It's like he's being groomed for something, man. It's just weird when McMahon has somebody that, <laughs> like Austin Theory with him, man. So Austin Theory's doing that weird shit with McMahon, McMahon in a selfie. If that's supposed to get me excited for him and Balor, not going to work. The match will be good, but we can do better. I would have loved to have seen a storyline that we give a fuck about actually happen at that dog park. No, they just took all that time for the fucking 24-7 roll-up championship. You can't do that, man. Get creative. Start bolstering up storylines. Get creative, man. I'm not asking for a lot here, man. That's the bare minimum. Literally the bare minimum. Get a swig of coffee. We'll continue on toward, uh, toward hour number three. No, no, we're still hour number two. Either way, swig of coffee, we'll continue. All right, so Queen Zelina is up next versus Rhea Ripley. New music for Vega too, man. Or at least I've never heard it before. I new, new to me. I don't know if it's brand new or not. Maybe I was taking notes at the time. Maybe I... Uh, I don't fucking know, man. I'm always doing a million things at once. But it was new to me, man. She's like, all oh, hail the queen or something right at the beginning. I forgot what the actual words were, but she has some... There's some talk. Zelina pretty much telling everyone to acknowledge her. And then it goes into the uh, the music, which again, I, I don't remember, but maybe it's always been there. Um, but it just stood out last night. And I love this, man. The queen is cutting a promo pre-match as she slowly walks down the aisle with the most beautiful women in WWE. As Corey Graves says, Carmella. Carmella is beautiful. I don't know about the most beautiful, man. I, I got some people, I think, ahead of her. But I love how Corey Graves, the, the, the whole match, this whole time was just, he kept saying it because... Last week, there was a lot of uh, people upset that he keeps talking about how beautiful Carmella is. And people actually got upset. And I'm like, what the fuck? He's being a heel commentator, and I fucking love that, man. What's wrong with telling a woman she's beautiful? Too fucking bad. Well, I see nothing wrong with that at all, man. So I love how he kept fucking... <laughs> he kept hammering all those people that cried last week. He kept fucking with them hardcore. And he kept bringing up how beautiful these women were last night. So anyway, as, as Queen Zelina slowly goes down the aisle, she's cutting this pre-match promo. And uh, the promo ended up being longer than the match. Probably not a shocking thing, but when, you, when she's... I mean, it's Queen Zelina versus Rhea Ripley. Zelina's on a winning streak, and Rhea Ripley is supposed to be a badass, so you think the match is going to be a little bit long. Seven, eight minutes bare minimum. Uh, that was not the case. Again, back to this promo. It was good. It was ripping apart Minnesota, or as she called, just a flyover state. <laughs> I love how every time she got angry at the crowd during her promo, the music would stop. The girl from Queens would come out, and the music stopped. Then she would transition back to the Queen persona, and the music, the music would pick back up again. So... I love that. When the Queens girl came out and she fucking, the accent kind of went away because the Queens came out of her, the music stopped. She was angry. Then she would transition right back to the fucking Queen and, and the music would play again. She was elegant. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, man, that's uh, that's great additions to the character. Uh, it's those little details that are not so minor. Um, so Zelina's been hitting fucking home run after home run lately. As for the match, if you blink, you missed it. <laughs> Zelina rolls up Ripley for the one, two, three, maybe in about 60 seconds. Um, if it went 90 seconds, it was barely. Um, and again, that was Rhea Ripley being rolled up by Zelina Vega. Uh, Rhea Ripley is the latest recipient of the awe-inspiring, ultra-devastating Farut Roll-Up. <laughs> Here you go. Bada-boom. That's for Rhea Ripley, guys. Budaka budaka. Rhea Ripley is the newest recipient. Let's break this award out for her and let's deliver it to her, man. Rhea Ripley, congratulations. You didn't almost win it. You went out and you won it. Fair and square. There it is, man. That's the Fruit Roll-Up Award. This is delivered to Rhea Ripley. There you go, Rhea. Ooh. Don't eat it all in one sitting. Um, we laugh, we joke about it, but it's, it's sad. Rhea Ripley's pretty much done, right? I, I don't know how she rectifies any of this. She's got a fucking, a kid in a costume next to her. She's losing via roll-ups in 60 seconds. I mean, this is the Shayna Baszler uh, situation all over again, where Baszler's supposed to be one of the baddest women on the planet. Rousey's right-hand gal. Badass. Legit. And, uh, and she loses in less than two minutes almost every match, and most of them are from the fruit roll-up. I see Rhea following the same trajectory. Um, yep. I do see seeds were planted uh, for Nikki Cross to turn heel soon. Rhea looks like she's getting angrier, and, and Nikki's kind of upset that she's been on a losing streak. She's, she, maybe she's going to be... Finished with almost accomplishing shit. Maybe she's going to be that old school Nikki Cross character and, and she's going to turn heel. I'm fine with that. Let's do that. Let's stop all of this fucking, uh, um, wh wh where's my fucking Kevin Hart fucking, uh, Snowball. Where's Snowball? Kevin Hart, the movie Secret Life of Pets, man. Right? Because that's what Nikki Cross is almost character. I mean, it's just a knockoff. Look at the fucking outfit, bro. It's not that hard to see. That's the, it's just a, it's the same fucking thing. She obviously was watching Secret Life of Pets 2, saw Kevin Hart's character, and that's it. That's the character. <laughs> it's not working, man. The old school Nikki Cross would have worked fine. All Vince McMahon needs to do is give you a fucking chance. So I'm okay if she goes back to the old character, man, even if that's turning heel. But uh, Rhea Ripley... Uh, fruit roll up last night. And, and, and I gotta be honest, man. Check out your girl, Zelina Vega. Check out Zelina Vega last night, man. This girl is on a winning brigade, bro. And I, when I say a winning brigade, check this. Queen Zelina has only three losses. I want you to think about this. Queen Zelina has only three losses in her last 16 televised matchups. That's 13 and three. If AEW was going to have their little statistics, if WWE was going to have the same thing AEW does, it would say 13 and three in her last 16 televised appearances. And by the way, those three losses, those three were all schmoz matches. One of them was a five person schmoz match. Her second loss was a, let me make sure I got this correctly. An eight woman tag match. And the third loss was a 10 women schmoz match. That was her only three losses. It was not one-on-one. -on -one. But in her last 16, she's been on the winning end 13 out of the 16. She has beaten the likes of Tony Storm, Carmella, Dewdrop a couple of times, Nikki Ash a couple of times, Rhea Ripley now. The last several months for Zelina, she is on fire. That girl is on fire. <laughs> She's on fire, brah. Alicia Keys would belt that to the, to, to the fucking high heavens of New York City. Because Zelina Vega is on fire. All those people, when she came back and called her a sellout and she's never going to be booked properly, she'll always be a jobber, you know? She's one of the only people in the company getting a solid push. 
It's less than a handful. Roman Reigns, maybe you could say Austin Theory, but Austin Theory just lost a few weeks ago to Big E. Right decision. Maybe he shouldn't have been in that match. Uh, yeah, so even he lost. Uh, so I, I'm Zelina Vega, man. Maybe a couple of people in the company are being booked properly. Zelina Vega is one of them. And I said that a month ago, man. And we never know, right? You could be hot one day and then Vince McMahon totally rips the carpet from underneath you. But I had people a month ago going, oh, BC, don't praise this man. You know, she's going to be right back to jobber status. And I'm like, well, well, let time tell that, right? At least give her the benefit now. Get, give her credit now, man. Enjoy this now while we do have it. No, man, I'm not going to like this. And here we are over a month later and she's still being booked correctly. So those people look like fucking idiots. All those haters because she didn't go to AEW and now they're, they're, they're forced to eat that tough shit stew because Zelina Vega is on fire. Pretty cool to see, man. You hate to see people like Rhea Ripley just getting rolled up in 60 seconds, but Zelina Vega, man, she, she has caught fire with this championship on her left shoulder, a fucking crown on her dome piece, <coughs> and Carmella on her right shoulder. Pretty good little fucking, pretty good little thing Zelina's got going. Bobby Lashley versus Seth Rollins is next. Match was about two minutes long. Kevin Owens hits the ring, wall up Seth Rollins. Thus, Bobby Lashley is DQ'd and no longer able to compete at the day one pay-per-view for the title. This was real clever strategy by Rollins and Owens. Or Owens, anyway. I don't think Rollins had a fucking clue that he was about to be wabakud by Owens. <laughs> so that was funny. He's like, what the fuck, dude? And then he gets declared the winner, and he's like, oh, oh, that was good. And again, that makes sense that Owens tapped out earlier because he was going to devise a plan later. He had two more opportunities. He wasn't just going to suffer the hurt lock. No, he was going to fucking come up with a scheme, and he would make sure that Bobby was not going to be in this match. So it made sense. I actually thought it was pretty smart to do it this way. Um, but it was all for naught anyway, because Adam Pierce and the Green Bay Packers tie that he had on, they came out and he declared that that's not going to go down that way. And not only is the match going to restart, but that match and the match later on with Big E and Bobby, if Bobby was to defeat Rollins, then that match later in the night with Big E, both are now going to be no DQ. So Rollins, or I'm sorry, Owens cannot be up to any schemes anymore, any of his fucking plans. So, the match is immediately restarted under Adam Pierce's call. And right when the bell rings, man, Seth Rollins is speared out of his boots. One, two, three, Bobby Lashley picks up the W. Kevin Owens' plan goes awry. So, Bobby Lashley makes it to the third match later on the main event with the Big E. And this sets up backstage Rollins and, uh, uh, Rollins and Kevin Owens trying to come up with some type of way that Big E wins this match later on. Um, and it's not that hard. BC's thinking, well, if they already declared no DQ, wouldn't you just beat the shit out of Bobby Lashley for 10 minutes and then just let Big E win? Unless Big E tries to play the ultimate face and doesn't want the help. It's funny, when it all ended out, when it all ended up the way it did, man, all of that actually happened. We'll go over that in a minute. First, it was Maurice hitting the ring. That's right. Maurice was back from Ms. TV. Maurice comes out by herself, and she was looking. I mean, wow, man. Um, fuck legs for days. She's got legs for decades. <laughs> BC's not big on blondes usually, but Maurice makes BC melt faster than Frosty on a summer's day. I mean, Maurice was just banging last night. Uh, Maurice introduces the Miz, and this was funny. Miz talks about WrestleMania season fastly approaching, so he and Maurice would like to endorse the first name to be inducted into the 2022 Hall of Fame, and it's none other th none other than the Miz himself, man. None other than fucking <laughs> Mike Mazanin, and I thought this was funny because he even has a video package played on the Tron, like they do for real inductees. It starts off with, Mike was a kid growing up in Cleveland, or whatever, you know, and it shows him as a kid and growing up. <laughs> I just thought this was great. Like, they went all out for that. I love when they actually show a little bit of fucking care in something. Like, they actually worked on something. Um, So that was just fucking great, man. Edge hits the ring, and he's 
fired up with more heat than a furnace, man. Edge does what Edge does best, which is cuts a masterclass in how to cut a promo 101. And this leads to Miz throwing a glass of bubbly in Edge's face. Edge goes to spear Miz, but Miz puts Maurice in the way, in the corner, so Edge stops right before he spears Maurice. Maurice is like, like shocked that Miz did that. And this allows Miz to deliver a skull-crushing finale. First, a kick to the dome piece of Edge, and then a skull-crushing finale. Um, Miz is proud of himself uh, for the plan that he hatched up. Use Maurice as, a, as the decoy and drop Edge on his dome piece. Miz is all proud of himself. Um, but Maurice is actually pissed off. Miz is screaming, what is your problem? It worked out. Maurice is screaming back, we have two kids, I'm a mother. What is your problem? What is wrong with you? She's screaming at Miz. Miz is yelling back. What is your problem? It worked. So they're screaming at one another. Maurice has enough and just smacks Miz upside his dome piece and storms off. Miz is chasing down Maurice. Um, this all was well done. I, I love the, the, the whole thing with Miz inducting himself into the Hall of Fame for 2022 and then, and then Edge comes out and says, this is what I told you last week. This is what I've always told you. You are your biggest enemy. You're your biggest obstacle. You're your worst own. You are your own worst enemy. You, you build yourself up overcompensating for what you don't have, what you did not accomplish. And if you just bring yourself down a few notches, you'd accomplish so much more and you would have the respect that you believe you should have from all your peers, from these fans. But you don't have that respect uh, because you're an ass, just like you told them last week. <laughs> so this, just, what I'm saying is this coincides with what Edge said last week. I love when a story kind of like makes sense and they keep telling, because there's, there's fans like BC, right? There's many fans that, that, that don't remember what happened last week, much less 10 minutes ago. There's a lot of fans like that. Vince McMahon preys on those fans. And he hopes that those are the fans that keep coming back and spending their money on everything WWE. And then there's fans like BC that are going to remember these promos. They're going to remember a story and they want it to make sense. They want it to evolve. Progress. Um, and, and what they said last week, you know, this week, it progressed. It evolved. It, they added layers to, to what, was, what was said last week. So I like that shit, man. I like when you can do that and have it make sense. It, it's not asking for a lot. It's literally bare minimum. Um, so again, it's a little detail to many people. It's not to me, man. Like everything they were saying to one another, it played off of last week. I, I just, I had to mention that because this is what I mean in promos, guys. You guys always hear me. You think I'm just complaining or just being negative. No, I, I, I have a clear sense of how these things should go. And when they're just not being done right, I can't stand that. Luckily, Edge knows what he's doing. He's known what he's been doing for fucking decades. He's one of the best to be on that stick. Not just wrestling, but on that stick. And Miz, whether you like him or not, man, he is really good on the mic as well, man. If you need him to talk for 10, 15, 20 minutes, Miz is the dude to do that. He might annoy the shit out of you, but he's the one to do that. So, I, I liked everything about that, man. And then the altercation was perfect. Miz uses Maurice. Maurice is like, what the fuck? There's a little bit of fucking animosity there. You could still continue this to where Beth does end up, like her and Miz get back together and Maurice does help him out. But there's still some like trust issues there. Like you're, you're so quick to use me, the mother of your children, just so you can one up this dude. So that tension and, and mistrust is still going to be there. But they're back on the same page to the point where Beth Phoenix come in and maybe in the next couple of months, maybe they do this at Mania. I don't know. But you have that mixed tag match. I'm all down for that mixed tag match. And it ends with Maurice turning on Miz and then Maurice takes off back home, right? I don't think Maurice wants to stick around that long. I think this is just to get us over to WrestleMania. And if that's the case, then it culminates with Maurice kind of turning on Miz. You would have to think. And, and this plants the seed for that. So, again, I could just go so many avenues with what we got last night. This was actually done correctly. I'm not saying it was epic or it was great 
right? You'll always get the people that just, they, they, they don't want to hear that anything was good in WWE. And I understand the product is that fucking bad. <laughs> that it, It's odd when we do, when they do something right. But this was actually done right, man. So, you know, the, the whole show was trash. Well, basically, but at least this was done right. And, and most things have been right with these two so far, you know? The, their first promo, yeah, I feel they took a little bit too much from Punk and Miz. Oh, I'm sorry, Punk and <laughs> negative, negative 2.0 Miz, right? Uh, MJF. CM Punk called him the wannabe Miz. That's funny. Aside from that promo, though, everything's been pretty uh, spot on with these two. I'm okay with seeing this story develop and the match. And if Beth Phoenix wants to come back and tussle up with Maurice, BC, sign me up for that shit. Main event was no DQ, Big E versus Bobby Lashley, the last opponent in the gauntlet that Bobby has to overcome to get into that day one um, main event title match. This was a pretty decent match, very physical, and it was long, man, 25-ish minutes. It was pretty fucking long. Again, physical. I just wish I cared more. I didn't really care about it. Um, it just, something was missing, that excitement from watching these two. And I love these two individually, and I want to see the best for them. I want to be excited when they're in the ring for them and just what I'm viewing I just didn't care about this match as much as I would have liked to. And, and that's because not a lot of build went into it. No care. Pretty much spot booking, right? Set it up a little bit before and put it out there. Um, but these two dudes, they did the work, man. They went in there and they busted their asses. So much props to them. Rollins and Owens hit the ring 25 minutes into this uh, match to attack Bobby. And this makes sense, like I said earlier, right? I mean, it's no DQ, and you don't want this guy to win. Wouldn't you just come out and beat him up from the start of the bell? What took them so long? So this makes sense, but what took you so long? Why would you wait to the very fucking end to come out and do what you should have done in the in the first minute? And I know, well, but Biggie, Biggie, you know, Biggie says he doesn't want the help of BC. So it doesn't matter what you want, man. You got to do what needs to be done. If you're going to do it at the 25 minute mark, why wouldn't you just have just done it at the 10 second mark? Who cares what Biggie told you? If you're going to do it anyway, get it done with. <laughs> um, but of course, Biggie doesn't want the help, just as he said. So he, he starts fucking tussling with him. You know, get the fuck out of here, blah, blah, blah. MVP ends up taking out Biggie's leg with his cane. And that sets up Bobby hitting the spear on Big E. And your champion of the world loses one, two, three, middle of the ring. Now, I'm all for Bobby being booked like a beast. I'm all for Bobby winning. If he's going to be added into this match, it was already a schmaz three-way. You might as well just make it a four-way then. Uh, at this point, make it a 10, 20, 30. It doesn't matter. A schmaz is a schmaz is a schmaz. And I don't like them. I don't like them because it's too many fucking bodies going for one title. It should be a champion versus a number one contender. One champion, one challenger. Once you add a third person, it becomes muddied. Those waters are now muddied. So whether it's 3, 4, 10, 20, 80, doesn't matter. 85, 95, do I hear 125? Do I hear a fatal 150 way? Might as well. Um, so if you're going to have Bobby in there, at least they fucking went about him running a gauntlet, basically. Not an actual gauntlet match, but three matches in one night. If you add them all up, man, this match was the longest. The other two were maybe two minutes on one and maybe five on the other. I don't know, fucking three matches, maybe 35 minutes. But Bobby Lashley, because of that main event, he put in the work last night. But um, but I'm okay with Bobby, you know, being booked that way. My problem is you can't have your champion, man, lose like that. Um, You can't have your champion lose a match middle of the ring on a fucking weekly show. That is your champion. He does. He should not be losing middle of that ring until he drops the title. And this company just takes their champions too often and they have them lose middle of the ring on a, on, in a nonsensical fucking irrelevant match usually on their television show. So your champions look like an absolute fucking clown in your championships. Look way less than prestigious. Let's just say that. The opposite of prestigious. I'm not saying they're 24-7 toy title status, but it just makes everything, it devalues everything. 
when you have your champions lose like that. No, nothing looks good in the process. Um, and that's kind of how we went off the air, man. Bobby Lashley added to the day one pay-per-view main event. One of the main events for the uh, WWE Championship. We knew that was coming. Uh, you guys, if you saw my my hour reaction, hour number one review, that was a live reaction watch along last night. And I told you guys that that's probably what the night was going to be about. It was going to be setting up Bobby Lashley to be added into the match. This company doesn't know what they're doing, man. Uh, not just month to month anymore. Week to week, day by day. I mean, they're minute by minute. We've been hearing the reports of Vince McMahon rips up scripts. Not just hours anymore, minutes before the show. Rewrites. This is a minute-to-minute production in this company from, from here on out for the foreseeable future. I don't see light at the end of their tunnel. And I don't think they do either. But that was the show, man. And we are now closer to day one. Where are we now on it? Uh, a couple more, two more go-home shows. Or two more shows, one go home on the 27th. So there's two Monday Night Raws left to build up this day one. I'm glad that it's at least being built up better than Extreme Rules. I'm still fucking, uh, well, I think we're all traumatized from the build up to Extreme Rules or lack thereof. I couldn't believe the lack of care into Extreme Rules. I mean, I'm still baffled by that. And, and, and that continued into the Survivor Series. The lack of care into the Survivor Series still befuddles me that this company could do such a crime. Because that's what it is, man. Um, so to see day one getting some love, that's probably why ticket sales are actually pretty fucking decent. Looks like it's going to be a legit sellout uh, by the time day one comes around. I believe that's, uh, what is that, Atlanta, Georgia, maybe? So it's looking like a sellout. Next up on deck, guys, is um, Wyndham is coming. I'm sorry, Winter is coming. Wednesday night, uh, Dynamite. A big little mini pay-per-view. It's called Winter is Coming. So many of you guys are calling it Wyndham is coming that I'm starting to call it that. Uh, winter is coming Wednesday night. What I would like to do for you guys, I cannot confirm this. I would like to do a live review uh, within 24 hours of that event. Not a live watch along. I can't do that on Wednesday nights. But um, at least a live review. Just like I'm doing now, but at least live, man. So I can get your guys take on it as well. I hope to do that. If, if there's any way possible, I'll be doing that review live for Dynamite. Winter is coming. So that's next up on the agenda. Stay subscribed and notified, obviously. I could always put up a bonus video later today. I could go live if a story breaks, for instance. Tomorrow, um, there's no show to really go over. I don't do NXT um, because they're just not at the viewership yet. Um, for people, There's not enough people to care for BC to put a review out for NXT. So we, re we really don't review a show on Wednesday, but... There could always be a bonus video, and usually I do send out a bonus video on Wednesdays. So there's just a lot of reasons to stay subbed and notified because you never know when BC is dishing out some content. But uh, Dynamite, there will be a review this week, obviously. Winter is coming. Is there a big surprise, a big shock debut? Does Tony Khan have something up his sleeve? He already said yes. He didn't say specifically for Winter is coming, but he said he has many surprises upcoming. Not just Winter is coming. He's talking about the holiday bash coming up at the end on Christmas Day. He's talking about events for next year. I mean, he's got shit lined up. So, should be a fun time, man, for AEW especially. So, until next time, guys. Thank you so much for joining me over a half an hour in this son of a bitch. Um, and that was only two hours a raw to go over. But we did have the cold open, more Jeff Hardy news. Matt Hardy finally speaking out. So, thanks, man. Uh, Red team, you know what we gotta do. We gotta go. We gotta go whoop that ass, man. Think, be, live, amped always. And until next time, man, BC, the amp man. On behalf of my Aaron Rodgers, Green Bay Packers-led staff, check you later. Salud, check you. Let me give a proper salute. My amplified unit. Salute.